it's one of these interesting mixed formats that we will be going through all through the autumn. I see a few people are in the IMC meeting room. Uh, you can wave up there. A lot of us are joining in from all over the world from different places uh, and it's great to see so many familiar and a few new faces here. We usually turn on the video at first just so that you can see who is in the room. You're most welcome to turn off the video during the talk etc. But it's great also as the discussion goes back on if you can turn on the video so that there is a sense of, of people being present. Uh, for now the university is open. No one knows what will happen over the next couple of months. I think we all have to adjust to a situation where the, the new normal is that we may not meet uh, physically. And if we can meet, it's just great. Uh, so for all IMC activities in the autumn, we are kind of running at plan A and at plan B. And we don't really know if plan A is to meet physically or plan A is not to meet physically. But they, those things will be running concurrent uh, with each other. Um, this also means that the IMC meeting room during this week here will be slowly transformed into a workspace instead of a meeting room. We can't fit that many people in anyway. And there is a great need for people to actually be able to come in and to meet up with each other on their situations and circumstances that seems to be okay. So uh, for now, you know, say bye to the meeting room as we know it. We hope we will get it back in order again once this is over, whenever that is going to be. Uh, Starting from next week, we'll be running a number of seminars that introduces our new toy, the FNIRS, a very cool technology that allows you to do recordings of brain signals that seem to be highly reliable and completely non-invasive. That also means that the IMC talk next Tuesday will be in the afternoon and because it's a speaker coming in from the US. So therefore, keep your eye open on the IMC website and on the Twitter channel, etc to see exactly when will the seminars be happening in the autumn. The default option is 11 o'clock mm -hmm. in this particular meeting room, but it might be shifting around. Uh, but for today, we are here at 11, somewhere here physically at IMC, somewhere elsewhere. And our speaker is uh, Rebecca Bandini, who has been a key person in the HOPE project since uh, March. Rebecca is a computational linguist who can tease all sorts of meaningful signals out of what would otherwise look like just a string of words or even letters. It's been really great to have Rebecca sitting on our Twitter data and making sure we can get something sensible out of what happens during these interesting times. Rebecca, it's all yours to take us through what really happened in Denmark and Scandinavia. <laughs> that's a that's a bit of a a big a big thing to promise. Um, we'll see we'll see what I have for you. So I'm going to try to. Uh, share my screen and then start a presentation. Um, play from... Okay, can everybody see my screen? Looks good. Great. Yes. Okay. Um, yeah, so the talk is called How the COVID-19 Crisis Unfolded in Scandinavian News and Social Media. And um, as the as the logo suggests, this is part of the HOPE project. Uh, so I'll actually start the talk by giving a little bit of background about the HOPE project in case you're not um, familiar. Um, then I'll talk a bit about the analysis that we've done of traditional media, so that is um, legacy news sources, um, and then move into the social media uh, collection and analyses that we've been doing. So this is very much work in progress. Um, so I'm actually going to, rather than present you with shiny published results, I'll rather be taking you on a tour of all of the sort of unexpected problems and methodological headaches and ambiguous results that you deal with when you are um, working with uh, a lot of data, um, rapidly collected. And um, yeah, so um, I'll, I'll end with some kind of informal discussion of research directions. Um, as HOPE gets to what we're calling the second phase of the project, uh, now is the time when we're really starting to think, what are the research questions that we want to guide us in the coming years of this project? What can we um, to bring together um, the many, many different and disparate sources of data we've collected rapidly since March. Um, and so I would actually love to make this a discussion where I get um, 
input and insights from some of you, since it looks like it's a pretty diverse group here with uh, a lot of different methodological backgrounds and um, disciplinary backgrounds. So without further ado, um, I'd actually like to begin this talk by doing a small reflective exercise together. So I want you to take a minute and just go back mentally to that time in March this year, those first few days when you realized that something very, very big was happening. So your whole daily life was suddenly upended by this global pandemic. And I want you to think about what it felt like. What were you doing? What were you thinking? What were your coping mechanisms? What was your relationship with, um, with the various streams of information that you consume? What sources did you turn to to cope with your uncertainty? It was a, a real shock event for all of us, it goes without saying. Um, even though, um, at least in present company, I think most of us were not actually at risk of at high risk of having the virus ourselves. But instead, we were all stricken with a different sort of illness or disorder, if you will, but one that was primarily informational. So I think what I felt and what a lot of people also seem to have felt is that we were in this state where there was overwhelming information overload, but intractably high entropy. So it didn't feel like more information was decreasing uncertainty, only increasing it. Um, and that was a very, uh, that, that feeling sort of dominated at least my experience of the first days of the pandemic. Um, and I think this framing is useful because as I move now into talking more about these sort of um, big data signals um, about information that we can extract from massive texts like newspaper corpora or social media during the pandemic period, I think it's helpful to sort of keep in mind um, also that individual level experience that each of us had um, in interacting with these information sources and this massive uncertainty during the same period. So the HOPE project, um, which many of you have probably heard of, uh, is is a project looking at how democracies cope with COVID-19 and it's very much a data-driven approach. Um, so the project uh, received funding from the Carlsberg Foundation in, in March, sort of very rapidly funded um, project because it was so, so timely and important. And the trajectory of the project has been always been understood to be divided into kind of two phases. The first one is really a fast um, and extensive data collection. So we don't necessarily know what we're gonna do with the data. We just know that we want as much data as possible. And I'll talk about uh, what kinds of data exactly in a minute. Um, but really we want anything that could help us uh, later on analyze the interplay of these main forces in the COVID-19 pandemic. So the trajectory of the virus itself the decisions of governments and international organizations, the media landscapes, and citizens' behavior and well-being. Um, and we want to look at all of these across uh, several different democratic societies for comparative purposes. So uh, a few weeks ago, we had a, a retreat for Hope, and um, Michael Bang Peterson, one of the PIs, came up with this uh, sort of useful way of visualizing flows of information during a pandemic. And we start with this sort of um, idealized model where um, the directionality is very clear. We have government decisions and policies that are sort of filtered through the media. They impact citizens' behavior positively. And this in turn impacts the epidemic unfolding, bringing infection rates down, and so on. So this is, this is the ideal. And you know, each of these stages can be linked with um, sources of information. So government decisions, uh, press conferences, press releases, um, policy, legislation, media, we uh, scrape uh, digital data from, you know, newspaper aggregators like Infomedia, and then also from social media platforms. Um, we can measure citizens' behavior through survey data, um, 
as well as mobility data uh, collected through cell phones and apps. And then, of course, there's um, the massive amount of epidemiological data from this unfolding pandemic. And, but the, the kind of um, insight that hope brings to this is that, of course, this model is too simple. And also, one of the, the nature of democracy is such that flows of information are not directly controlled by any particular um, force or entity. They're potentially challenged by many, many different things. So, um, you know, biased news coverage, misinformation, mistrust of political leaders, or, um, you know, overly stringent policy decisions that, you know, the public can't actually cooperate with. Um, so we want to look uh, particularly at sort of the, the complicating factors that arise in a model like this. Um, and we also want to look at, of course, the, um, the, the bi-directionality of all of these different uh, uh, sort of forces and data sources. Um, so our focus today is, of course, on the media component. And, um, you know, HOPE is a very big project spanning three universities. It's going to be multiple years. Um, there's a small army of affiliated researchers. I am just reporting on one very small corner of, of this project. Um, and there are also, there are other people within the project who are working on media stuff. Um, but this is primarily reflecting what's been done here at Aarhus University. Um, with the, the data and the, the computation side has been uh, a joint effort with some of our developers at the Center for Humanities Computing here. So much thanks to them. Um, and now that we're starting to get to the phase where um, you know, we've collected a lot of data uh, and, and I'm starting to try to think about it with a research framework in mind, um, I've been starting to think about this uh, as in, in a, an approach that's known as crisis informatics, which looks at the interconnectedness of people, organizations, information, and technology during crises and disasters. Um, and I think this is the approach that we want to take to this, uh, this sort of media data as a component of this larger networked model that I was just talking about. Um, I'm actually going to skip ahead a little bit and come back to crisis informa informatics later. Um, but one of the um, one of the components of, of the crisis informatics framework is um, thinking about um, thinking about our our data, our textual data in information theoretic terms. Um, and so, uh, a project that we've recently done at, at here at Aarhus and with collaborators at other universities is um, is an information theoretic approach to um, newspaper data during the COVID nineteen pandemic. So um, the questions that are guiding us here are what, when can we identify the height of the informational and the epidemiological crisis period according to a nation's newspapers? Um, how can we do this using you know, statistical not models to extract signals from um, these texts, these corpora? Um, and it turns out that, that a crisis uh, like this has a very particular statistical fingerprint in, in newspapers. Um, so that's what I'm going to start this talk with, is talking about our results here. So a quote to sort of get us started is, nothing travels faster than the speed of light, the possible exception of bad news, which obeys its own special laws. So the motivation for this is, of course, um, we saw, I'm sure it's not surprising for anyone, uh, to, to hear me say that um, this was a pretty unprecedented uh, global phenomenon in, in news coverage, right? Because as this wave of the illness, we had a pretty unusual degree of content alignment also spreading around the world. So by January, all of the news in Wuhan region and probably further afield in China all of the, the breaking news was probably COVID related. A little bit later in February, this, um, this sort of takeover of the whole 
breaking news ecosystem comes to Europe, then later to the US. So um, what we like to do is, is take this perspective of cultural dynamics um, and treat the COVID-19 pandemic as a natural experiment to allow us to study the effect of global catastrophe on the dynamics of, of news media's information. Um, and to look at this, uh, you know, within different countries um, and compare and compare across them um, and also look at how the um, the genre or the political alignment of news media um, influences how the um, how the sort of information dynamics plays out so we're using COVID-19 um, as, as a proxy for more broadly looking at how cultural information systems respond to catastrophes. And a feature of COVID-19 that we're particularly interested in is that it's a catastrophe that has both natural and social factors. So there's a, a good deal of work that has inspired um, our present work um, that looks at these sort of information dynamics associated with different types of catastrophes. And has suggested that natural catastrophes have a sort of different um, statistical profile than um, social catastrophes. So a cat social catastrophe would be something like war. Natural catastrophe is something like um, an earthquake or a uh, hurricane. Um, COVID-19 we find actually has a, a sort of composite profile. It looks a bit like both. So, um, in order to sort of in, sort, in order to sort of detect uh, what the catastrophic uh, signal looks like um, in the COVID-19 period, we have to get um, a baseline uh, baseline measure of the information dynamics. Um, and to do this, um, so our whole analysis rests on, on on two main tools: latent variable modeling in our texts and um, the, you know, the design of our of our, of our um, analysis rests on information theoretic um, principles and, uh, and equations. So the paper in preparation is called News Information Decoupling, um, an information signature of crisis in news media, and you can see it's a, it's a joint effort. Um, and our main proposal is that uh, there's this principle of news information decoupling that says the catastrophe initially disrupts ordinary information dynamics by decoupling um, novelty and resonance. So novelty and resonance are two um, signals in the um, in in two two signals in in the texts. So what is novelty? Um, novelty is basically a measure of how different the content in a given article is from past articles in a certain window. So what we're really asking is, uh, if we look at the front page, um, I should mention, um, we're actually not, uh, not working with um, individual articles here. We're actually aggregating front pages day by day for each of the newspapers we're working with in this, um, in this project. So if we look at the front page today, um, and say we're interested in maybe a, 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 w a window of about a week, how different is, the, the content, the topics on the front page from what we were reading about a week ago. Transience is basically just um, taking, taking this the other direction. Um, a week from now, how different is the content going to be from what we read on the front page today? And then resonance is the degree to which, um, so resonance is basically just novelty minus transience. So what it's what it's giving us is the degree to which future articles conform to an article or a front page SJ's novelty. So it's basically fitting resonance to novelty. Um, so these are not these these are not uh, notions oh, that have originated in our work. These are are, are pretty well known um, in the information theoretic uh, language processing literature. Um, we are using a, we are going to kind of um, suggest some, some particular ways of implementing these that are more novel. Um, and we are using uh, 
yeah. These are not our creations, is all I'm trying to say. Um, so what data are we using? Well, we're starting with just Danish newspapers. Um, and uh, thanks to InfoMedia and AU's Data Lab, uh, we've been able to, to access um, the text of most of the major Danish newspapers from December 2019 to the present. So um, first, of course, we have to pre-process the data. We do this by removing numerals, stop words, we lemmatize and we, we case fold. So we convert everything to lowercase. Um, and then as I mentioned, we aggregate daily front page news. So an article is basically a daily front page, um, which means that we are crucially working with the digitized print editions of these papers. Um, and then we um, what we do is we, we vectorize the data. So we represent the data as a bag of words model, which simply means that we're getting rid of any sort of contextual information as though we've taken the text and cut out all the words, put them in a bag, and we can draw them out one by one. Um, and so you can imagine this just representing a, a text, a front page, as a, gigant as a gigantic graph that just means all of the co-occurrence information, um, what words co-occur with words in that uh, document. Um, and we use um, latent direct lay allocation to generate a dense low rank representation of this front page. So this is a type of topic model. Um, and so the, the, the latent variables in, in this analysis are, are basically the topics, um, the topics that characterize uh, a given article. So what do our baseline dynamics look like for Danish newspapers? So that means before, uh, before the coronavirus crisis really hit Denmark. So what we do here is um, we're looking at the interplay between novelty and resonance um, between December 1st and February 27th of this year. Um, and we're, what's plotted here is the beta coefficient, which is just the slope fitting resonance on novelty. Um, and you see have, we have four different papers here. And I don't, I don't know an awful lot about um, the orientation of Danish newspapers, but, but I do know that um, Berlinske is like a kind of classical conservative paper. Um, Extrabladel is a sort of tabloid. Um, I'm not sure, I, I think it's more on the conservative side. Um, Politiken is maybe a classical liberal paper. Um, does anyone who's Danish want to jump in and correct me? Oh, it sounds good. Yes. Yeah? yeah. Okay. And, and information, I, I'm realizing I don't know. Is that kind of more um, center left? It is very left wing. Oh, information is very left wing. Okay. Um, but what we see here is that the, uh, you know, the political orientation of these papers doesn't have uh, much of an impact on, on you know, on this beta coefficient. The normal state of affairs in all of these papers is a medium to strong association between novelty and resonance, um, at least within a relatively short time frame. So in this time frame, it's, it's a couple months. Um, so let's look more closely at, um, at Politiken. Um, so here is, here's where we see this phenomenon that we're calling um, uh, information decoupling. So can you see my mouse if I, yeah, okay, good. Um, so what we've done here is we've just um, just put labels um, on particular uh, events um, that we think are, are, are important and that align with uh, signals in the, in the data. Um, and what we see is that, uh, okay, so the first period is sort of from December um, up until January when this is just kind of a Wuhan phenomenon. Uh, the second period is this, this very lengthy period when um, people outside of China are becoming aware of coronavirus. It is in the news, but it hasn't really, um, hasn't really spread yet. Uh, towards the end of February, um, this, the virus really hits uh, Denmark. We have our first cases, and then it occurs um, just a couple weeks later. And then uh, we fix the uh, sort of on to the reopening of schools um, in mid-February after Easter. 
So what we see is that um, the decoupling, uh, which is kind of where, where novelty um, goes down um, dramatically and sort of breaks with resonance, um, you know, breaks this, this nice uh, sort of strong to medium association that we saw before. This happens um, actually earlier than, um, than you might expect. It, it occurs before, um, before lockdown and the, the sort of uncontrolled local transmission actually starts. Um, so you can see this more clearly here, where what I've done is, you know, I've, I've, I've just, um, I'm giving you for each period, uh, this is the, the beta coefficient, um, the, the fit of, novel, of resonance on novelty for all of the, um, the daily points during that period. Um, so one thing I want to, I want to mention is that you'll see that there are, there are a bunch of different lines here. Um, all these are, are representing our sort of different levels of um, abstraction on the, uh, on the signal. So we're using um, a type of uh, adaptive filter to smooth the signal. Um, so what you see in gray is, is raw. Um, it hasn't been smoothed. Um, and then you'll see there's a light red line, a darker red line, and a black line. Um, and the, the sort of darker the color, um, the more abstract. Um, kind of the more abstract the signal, so the, the more we're smoothing. And the goal here is, so what you see, the, see the difference between gray and black, with gray you're getting all of these local, um, local blips, all, these, all this variation um, on a very short time scale, um, and in black we've pretty much entirely smoothed that out, so we just get the sort of pure, more, um, more regular signal. So, um, that's not really the, the focus here, but I just wanted to explain why it is that you see multiple lines here. So what we're really doing here is just, um, you know, measuring trends, sort of measuring informational trends. But we're doing this in um, in a in a in a latent distributed fashion. So rather than doing um, what would be more traditional trend detection where you have some keywords or some topics that you want to um, sort of measure the novelty of and, and you go in and you search for uh, how prevalent they are in texts over a given time series. Instead, what we're doing is we're, um, we're, we're measuring trend detection using these latent variables so we can um, measure this uh, across everything. So we're not doing this atomized selected uh, trend detection, but rather sort of distributed um, trend detection. Um, so these were the Politiken front pages. Now let's compare this with, um, with Berlinska. So we see um, similar information decoupling happening, happening around the same time um, between the sort of virus coming to uh, Denmark and the imposition of lockdown. Um, here is the sort of snapshot by snapshot pattern. And let's look more closely at um, Politiken and Berlinska. So Politiken is the top row, Berlinska is the second row. Um, what you might notice here is that uh, while they're fairly aligned, um, so that they're fairly aligned in the baseline, um, and in the second phase, um, and both of them undergo a decoupling in the third phase, um, we see some deviation uh, between Politiken and Berlinska in the, in the reopening phase. So um, this, is, uh, so this is something that, that you know, um, I, I haven't thought much about, but my collaborators, uh, have some interesting thoughts about why this might be, some interesting hypotheses. So um, why might it be that we get a different signal between the more liberal paper and the more conservative paper during the reopening period? So specifically, um, by the final phase, uh, yeah, Politiken looks um, you know, fairly back to normal. Um, Berlin's on the other hand, has a more sort of chaotic uh, signal for the 
reopening period um, through the final phase. And this is something that you can actually see much uh, more clearly if we use a, a windowed classification um, of our uncertainties. What we've done here is we've taken, um, so what we've done here is we've basically taken a, a window um, that is symmetrical uh, across the whole data set. So we've partitioned our data, our, our signal up into even but overlapping parts um, that are symmetrical. And each data point here um, is the fit of resonance on novelty over a window of 21 days. Um, so this is really nicely smoothed out. And if you take any individual day, what you'll get is the fit of a 21 day window. So that's what you see with these little windows um, over our four sort of events. Here we see a really stark difference between Politiken and Berlinska. Um, so specifically we see um, a kind of exuberant return to the normal, um, normal very, very close association around reopening in Berlinska, and then a huge drop off, like back into pure chaos, um, decoupling of novelty and resonance. Um, the hypothesis that my, my collaborators, Christopha and, and, and Melvin are entertaining is that um, basically this, this period after the initial reopening constituted a different sort of crisis for, for Berlinska, but not for the liberal paper. Um, and that's the crisis of having a, um, a very strong and in control um, prime minister from a different party who is exercising a lot of control over the reopening and um, still enforcing restrictions and threatening, um, you know, going, going back to more stringent restrictions. And this, um, this caused sort of a, a second wave of um, crisis for the conservative paper, um, not for the liberal paper. So this is the point in the analysis where we really need um, some qualitative analysis um, and some actually looking at, at the front pages and, and reading what's there and um, a, different, a different sort of, of, of research. But um, I think it's pretty interesting uh, to look at these, these sort of strong, generally held patterns across newspapers, but then some variation that seems to be politically or socially or, or culturally um, conditioned. So the next steps for this information dynamics work that we're doing um, is, as I just said, more qualitative analysis of particular external events as driving forces for the, the patterns that we see. Um, what I'm particularly interested in, because it's more in my, in my wheelhouse, is how underlying latent variables, um, the topics that is, how do they drive the information dynamics? Um, so you may have noticed that we, uh, we structured the data, we, we sort of pre-processed the data using LDA. Um, so we have latent topics in our model, but we didn't actually use them in this analysis. So we didn't really, um, we didn't learn anything about particular topics that are driving these patterns. So that's a very natural next step. Um, I'm also interested in, in using this uh, to explore the interaction between legacy and social media. Um, so actually the next part of my talk was supposed to be um, a, a basically application of these same models to our um, very large sample of Scandinavian Twitter data. Um, but uh, there, were some, there were some problems with the processing of that. Um, first of all, the first, the first round produced really, really bad topic models, which made sense because uh, we had not optimized it for Twitter yet. Um, but in the end, we just, we just didn't, um, didn't get the analysis done in time. So that will be for the next talk. Um, but also, uh, right down the road, is extension to other countries. So we're very fortunate that we already have access to Norwegian and Swedish newspapers um, 
in completely uh, in in whole from their respective royal libraries. So that concludes this section. Um, and now I'll move on to the, the social media portion of the talk. Um, I'm going to start by talking about a uh, sampling methodology in some detail. Um, so how do we collect, how do we collect small Scandinavian tweets? So why do we collect social media in the first place? Um, I, I, I sometimes think about what it would be like to um, study the social dynamics of a massive global catastrophe like this 20, 30 years ago before the widespread, um, so the, you know, the widespread availability of social media platforms. And um, it would be very difficult to sort of have access to the, um, the everyday individual um, experiences and thought process, processes and uh, directions of attention of just uh, regular everyday people in different societies. So social media, I think, is a really um, fascinating thing to study especially at a time like this, because it's the closest you can come to sort of reading the whole planet's diary in an aggregated form. Like a diary, it's time aligned, it's very event oriented, but it's also idiosyncratic, it's messy, it's more informal than legacy media, more personal, more emotional. Um, this brings a lot of challenges, uh, but it also uh, brings really interesting insights. Um, so there are many different, when we talk about social media, you know, there are many different platforms. So um, this is, this figure is from a study of social media usage among, um, in the Nordics. Uh, I think it's from 2006, so it's not too old. And what you see here is that there's very high social media usage overall, um, but not evenly distributed among the platforms. Facebook has the most saturation by far in all four countries. Um, and Twitter's, Twitter's actually pretty low. Um, whenever you work with uh, social media data, but particularly with Twitter, um, you have to make a lot of caveats and always, uh, always remember that it's not a representative sample. It's a very particular subset of people who use Twitter. Who use Twitter. Um, what is Twitter sort of known for um, relative to the other social media platforms? Well, one of its big draws is uh, accounts of politicians, public figures, celebrities, um, and their fans. So um, these accounts tend to have a lot of influence. They have a highly disproportionate um, follower to following uh, ratio. Um, it's also very popular among journalists, popular among academics, as many of us know, um, and a population I would call sort of engaged news consumers. So not necessarily professional journalists, but um, people for whom just reading the front page isn't enough. They want to go deeper. They want to read more. They could scroll all day. Um, maybe they, they, they may be uh, they may desire more sort of wider news or more breaking news before it comes out. Um, and this group includes, um, it includes people from all kind of political spectra. Um, as you may know, like, you know, conspiracy theories kind of run rampant on, on Twitter, but um, in a sense, conspiracy theorists are also part of the engaged news consumers uh, community. It's just, uh, they're defined by the kind of news and the kind of narratives that they're pursuing. Um, you might also call these like news junkies. Another feature of Twitter is that it's not as truly horizontal as say um, Facebook groups uh, for the reason that you know Facebook groups are, are generally um, sort of true horizontal communities of say people with the same interests or people in a in, in a literal local community. Um, not communities that are uh, say, built around a high-profile um, influencer account with a lot of followers. So that's another difference between um, Twitter and Facebook. Twitter doesn't really have anything like the structure of groups on Facebook. Um, 
instead it has it has networks through um, sort of second order properties like follower following networks or um, hashtags. People follow hashtags in a way um, you are sort of making a making something like a group with the other people who follow and use that hashtag, um, but it's not quite the same. So this is all to say that we would really like to be working uh, with Facebook data. It would be a much more representative sample of the Danish public, um, but uh, this, is, this is pretty much impossible for us right now for, for several re reasons. Um, the main one being uh, just the um, terms of use uh, for Facebook, as well as the GDPR uh, regulations. Um, it's really uh, not possible to collect data from Facebook in the way that we do with Twitter. Uh, we do have access for the HOPE project we, through uh, Anya Beckman and Data Lab. We do have access to something called Crowd Tangle, um, which is a, uh, a sort of analytics dashboard for Facebook, which will allow us to collect some information about um, groups, um, like how many members they have, um, how many posts a day, um, engagement, like likes and shares, but we can't really collect raw text the way that we do with Twitter, um, which makes CrowdTangle not a super great solution for, you know, for NLP research. So this is just, this is just a, a, a problem um, for social media research on, on Facebook. But in general, um, on all platforms, you have to deal with the problem of, you know, lots of noise, um, lots of data, but lots of bots, ads, and irrelevant posts. Um, you have to choose a platform that is going to um, allow you to collect data there uh, according to its terms of use and you're going to want a platform that has an api um, so a way of interfacing with um, with the platform and getting the raw data and um, so we're using uh, twitter of course um, but even with twitter which is extremely friendly uh, relative to other platforms extremely friendly for people who want to collect data. Um, comprehensive sampling is truly impossible. The free Twitter streamer um, only allows uh, you to collect up to 1% of all the tweets um, that, are, that are being published during that time. Um, and retroactive collection, so you are able to use the, the free API to collect up to a week in the past tweets, but anything further than that, you have to pay for. And um, so retroactive collection quickly becomes insurmountably expensive because I think the, the approximate price of a single tweet is about 15 cents. So uh, American cents, that's, that adds up. So um, I should preface this by saying early on, um, I and, and many other social media researchers and data geeks I know, started frantically trying to collect, uh, stream data from Twitter during this COVID-19 um, epidemic. It was an epidemic at the time. So starting in about late February, um, I and like everybody else just started uh, querying lots of different COVID-related hashtags. Um, and uh, at the Center for Humanities Computing, we also very quickly got set up with a, with a bunch of different um, collection streams relating to um, COVID hashtags, COVID, sorry, Denmark-specific COVID hashtags, um, and so we were getting, um, we were getting a lot of data, uh, but um, one issue was that, well, it was limited to Denmark, um, but then also it wasn't going to allow us to sort of measure the, um, the, the degree of impact COVID had on the discourse in the long term, since we were selectively sampling only COVID related tweets in the first place. Um, so around, uh, I think in, in early April, um, we decided that we were going to try to figure out a way to um, sample not only Danish tweets, um, uh, all Danish tweets, we wanted to try to get as many tweets as possible, not just the COVID related ones, but also the same for, for Sweden and Norway, um, so that we could do the sort of cross uh, national cross cultural comparative study that that I think hope is is very much about um, 
these three countries are a, a particularly interesting case study because of course they're so socioculturally and linguistically close but they chose such different measures to confront the pandemic so this is just a screenshot of the um the uh interactive visualizer for the COVID-19 government response stringency index which aggregates data about um, government policies in response to the pandemic and how severe they are. Um, so as you can see, you know, Sweden uh, really never um, came anywhere close to as stringent as, as Denmark and Norway, rather famously so. Um, and Denmark and Norway have also sort of parted ways. Um, the data set is, is much more nuanced than this. You can actually, uh, if you get the full data set, you have information about, um, you have coded categories uh, like travel related, school closure related, gathering related um, for all the different policies within a country. So it's a very rich and, and cool data set. But um, anyway, these three countries, very different approaches. So what we would really like to do, um, if we could get this big data set of all the Scandinavian tweets. Um, we'd like to look at how public discourse around the pandemic um, was influenced by different uh, policy approaches, um, how sentiment was affected, and then um, we'd like to see if we could extract information about behavioral changes and compliance with COVID-19 mitigation policies, like canceling travel plans or not going to summer homes, um, or eventually mask wearing. The benefits of uh, social media, of course, are um, that we have a reflection of public reactions in a more continuous and real-time fashion, and we have stronger cues to sentiment and emotional valence than we would um, using, say, newspaper data. Um, so our ideal data is, yes, this comprehensive sample um, coupled with other data sets tracking uh, maybe external forces or, or events um, that might influence sentiment discourse patterns. So here's our challenge. Um, you, the Twitter API actually makes it impossible to isolate samples from a single country or language. So we can't just go in and say, I want all the Danish tweets. Um, there are also the rate limits that I mentioned. So we can't, um, another approach would have been to, let's say we could have just sampled, you know, all the tweets written in, uh, Roman characters, and then we could use a language classifier to pick out all the Danish, Swedish, and Norwegian ones. We can't do that because of the rate limits. So we have to come up with a way of, of, of sort of balancing this. Um, our imperfect solution is to use language as a proxy for country. Um, so we're going to assume Danes, uh, people, people writing in Danish are from Denmark, people writing in Norwegian are from Norway, or are in Norway. Um, and we're going to maximize sampling from uh, these languages using text alone, um, using just a big disjunctive keyword query. So word X or word Y or word Z, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and we're gonna draw this from stop word lists in the three Scandinavian languages. And stop word lists are of the most kind of frequent, commonly used words in languages. So they're the words that are most likely to um, come up in any given text. So that's maximizing what we call recall. Um, but then at the same time, we need to make sure to minimize false positives. If you think about the most common words in, in, in Danish, a lot of them are very, um, they're very short words, like, um, like e or um, ella or o. Um, these words could very likely uh, be string identical to uh, words in other languages that are not Danish, Norwegian, or Swedish. So we want to make sure that we exclude the, the stop words that are going to bring in a lot of noise from other languages. So this is a very tricky task. Um, here's, here's what we did to construct the word list. So we started with uh, three lists, the most common Norwegian, Danish, Swedish words from open subtitle uh, corpus. Um, it, consists of 50, so the corpus consists of 50,000 words per language and their frequencies, so it's easy to get this. Um, so then we pruned the word lists uh, for precision, so made sure that we got rid of any strings that would occur in a language other than Scandinavian ones. Um, 
did this for each Scandinavian language. And then we just combined the 100 highest frequency words from each language list and combined keeping only the unique words. So we have this sort of composite stop word list now that without, uh, without selecting specifically for Danish, Norwegian, or Swedish, we'll sort of collectively sample them um, in a relatively balanced way and with relatively um, high precision. Um, after we've collected them, uh, we, can, we can classify them. We actually ended up using Twitter's native, native classifier because it worked better than um, a classifier. We often use an NLP Lang Detect. So, um, so then afterwards we have you know, three uh, separated language data sets for these three languages. There are limitations to this approach. Um, there is some lossiness. Uh, so of course there are gonna be tweets out there in Danish, Norwegian, or Swedish that happen to not have any of our stop words. Um, this set would include tweets that only have an image, a hashtag, or a URL. We'll miss those. Classification is always imperfect. Um, we can't really do anything about that. Um, and then there's this, this sort of simplifying assumption that we made, which is, you know, language as proxy for, for, um, for nation, for, for where you are or what society you belong to. Um, and what we're missing here is, is of course, uh, we're probably missing tweets from immigrants in Denmark who don't use Danish, including me. Um, Danes abroad who are maybe not tweeting in Danish, but of course they're tweeting about Denmark. They're very much engaged in the discourse around Denmark. Um, and of course, just native Danes using other languages. A lot of Danes uh, write in English. So, um, so this is not ideal. Um, but our but our methodology is is actually um, seems to be quite good. We seem to be uh, collecting an almost comprehensive sample of tweets from these three languages, um, and we definitely come closer to a representative sample than um, really well-known uh, Twitter archival um, efforts like the um, Library of Congress Twitter archive or National Australian Twitter collection. We have an easier task, of course, with these, uh, with these small language communities, but um, we could try to partially solve this problem of, of um, the lack of multilingualism by combining our text-based, our language-based sampling with user-based sampling. So that would mean that we would come up with a way of sort of um, identifying um, or identifying the likely Danish posters. Um, so instead of Danish tweets, Danish posters. So based on the location information they supply in their profile or other cues to uh, national origin. This is the approach that the Australian national, the, the national Australian Twitter collection took. So um, they uh, constructed a very complicated way of trying to identify um, Australian Twitter accounts and they have just been been following streaming from those accounts for for years now so we could combine this with our text-based sampling we could also use some hashtag based samples um, hashtag based queries rather so um, hashtags that are there are a lot of hashtags that are fairly specific to Denmark so that could also help um, so we put in a lot of work <laughs> to coming up with this way of, of collecting data from the three Scandinavian languages within the limitations I described. Um, and it's, it's already really paid off that, that we worked on this because um, our Danish tweet set is part of the Danish GigaWord project now. And we're now, um, Christopher Nilbo and I and um, Anya Beckman and uh, collaborators at Nike um, are looking into establishing a, a permanent uh, Scandinavian Twitter database of some sort. So this would be um, infrastructure to support the continuous collection and storage of Scandinavian tweets um, for the purpose of, of research. So it would also allow researchers to access it, um, which would be great so that no one has to go through uh, what we've done again. So for the last part of my talk, I'm gonna talk about um, moving towards actual analysis of Twitter data. And as I mentioned before, we, um, 
I don't actually have what I'd hoped to present here. Um, so, but I can still give you give you a sense of of, of what we're doing, um, and it'll it'll lead up to talking about to to the discussion that I'd like to have about um, sort of next steps and research directions. So, what can we do with this Twitter data once we have it? The different types of data that you get from Twitter um, lend themselves to different types of analysis. So, um, you can get information about networks by using uh, follower and following information associated with a user account. And this can allow you to, uh, to look at like influence, group membership, um, hashtags. Similarly, you can look at co-occurrence patterns to learn something about topical or conceptual associations. Hashtags can also function as a way of signaling sort of um, group membership um, or, um, yeah. So there's also a sort of textual data. So, so information you can extract from the text themselves. So topic models, we've already discussed a bit, information dynamics, sentiment and stance. Um, and then at, at the sort of most difficult end of the spectrum, there would be something like argument structure. So actually um, extracting, um, extracting the components of, of, of arguments that people make in natural language. Like, um, you know, if Bill Gates funds the vaccine, I won't take it. To be able to extract the fact that 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 the the meaning behind that is, I won't take the vaccine because um, you know Bill Gates funded it or something like that. So these are all things that we're we're quite interested in. Um, what we've kind of started with is focusing on discourse and sentiment. So what are people talking about uh, during this crisis and when? Um, how does the COVID nineteen discourse evolve over time? Um, what are the relative sizes of topics? Are there that are sort of so big that they're um, fairly stable over time? They sort of define the whole period of, of pandemic discourse. Are there, uh, what are the, the smaller topics that maybe are more temporally fleeting that come and go? Um, some examples of the latter would be uh, hamstring. It was a big topic for a few minutes in, in, in March when we had um, some supply chain anxiety um, or uh, some molisk. Um, so a few weeks ago, there was a lot of discussion of um, infection rates among Somali, Danish uh, um, ethnic minorities. So we've seen, we've seen these dynamics. We know these dynamics are there. Um, what kind of, of models can we use to, uh, to extract them and study them in more detail? And then sentiment, which most of you are probably familiar with. It's the way of, of measuring what the emotional impact um, is of a text um, of any, any length. Um, so we'd like to know what the emotional impact is of the um, unfolding of the pandemic in different places, um, at different stages of the epidemic unfolding, at different stages of the policy interventions, so um, yeah, and so we, we're particularly interested in this for the comparative study of the Scandinavian countries. So as I discussed a little bit earlier, um, an LDA topic is, is essentially a collection of words that are used in similar contexts. And we get this contextual information um, by um, collecting co-occurrence information within documents. So if we look at words associated with each topic, we can get an idea of what people talk about when their discourse is converging on a common topic or theme. So um, I'm going to talk about the topic models that we did way back in March. Um, and my presentation is a bit uh, informal because it, it was a, that, was, that was the audience I presented to. Um, but it'll give you a sense of, of what we did. Um, and then I'll talk a bit about uh, the next round of topic models that we're hoping to do. And the topic models I'll describe now are actually just for Danish because we didn't yet have the, uh, the whole Scandinavian Twitter uh, set. Um, so the first thing we do in topic modeling is um, uh, pre-processing. So pre-processing the texts tends to greatly increase uh, the sort of uh, success and legibility of your topic models. Um, so it's typical to maybe select um, parts of speech. So use a part of speech tagger to um, automatically 
identify the part of speech of each word in your data set so that you can filter out um, words that you just know based on category are going to be less informative. So prepositions and determiners like the and uh, just take them out. Um, then we lemmatize, which means that we um, take off any sort of uh, morphology. So like run and runs and running all become um, uh, run. Um, we um, remove emoji potentially. Um, of course, we'd want to keep emoji for other types of analysis like sentiment analysis. Um, and it depends on, you know, you may, you may choose to do one thing or another, but um, many times people choose to keep mentions and hashtags um, since these can sort of function as topical um, organizing flags on Twitter. So in a sense, uh, hashtags um, are, are sort of like author defined topic tags for their own tweets. Um, then we, we set up uh, the LDA model. So um, I think for our early work, we just used, uh, used uh, the, the Python library GenSim's default um, LDA parameters. Um, so one unigram, so that it is like one, um, one word like unit is one term and one tweet is one document. So each tweet is its own document. Um, we had 100 iterations, 30 passes, and end topics based on coherence. So that's actually the, the next number two. Um, again, using Jensen's default uh, parameters. Um, we tried fitting between five and 300 topics um, to see what would give us the best coherence. So um, coherence is a, yeah, is a measure of sort of um, the robustness of the topic based on your hyperparameters. So whether you're trying to prioritize um, the uniqueness of words in a given topic or um, rather the strength of association of words in a given topic, um, we ended up getting good coherence scores for between, uh, for topic models with between 10 and 22 um, topics. So, uh, and just qualitatively, 20 seemed to maximize human legibility. So when we read um, topic models that were generated in, in, in sets of 20, these seemed to make the most sort of intuitive sense to us. And, you know, to some degree, that is actually, well, in some cases, that is actually what you're trying to capture, um, the sort of human legibility. Um, and then we, yeah, then we kind of visualize the results in various ways. So um, we actually took two different approaches to topic modeling during this period, um, and it was an interesting experiment. So uh, one way was to use unguided topic modeling, um, although we did, uh, we did train the topic models in event aligned bins. So um, for example, pre, uh, pre coronavirus in Denmark, first cases to lockdown, lockdown to reopening and so on. Um, and then uh, another approach that we used was, was guided topic modeling. So I really liked the idea of doing guided topic modeling because it, um, it sort of took advantage of these, this wonderfully diverse large research group that we're part of here at HOPE. Um, we have a great team of ethnographic researchers at HOPE um, who are working with uh, different populations within Denmark, doing interviews um, and surveys, and so we asked them to come up with a sort of lexicon of the corona crisis in Denmark um, that they had, uh, so just a list of words, words that seemed salient to them based on their own work. Um, so there were, as of June 6th, there were 76 words on the list, um, and researchers were asked to not only um, come up with the words, but then also uh, categorize and subcategorize them. So we have another level of information about um, the sort of interrelatedness between some of these words. A lot of them are quite novel. Some of them are, are new coinages from the coronavirus period. Um, others are sort of newly salient terms like hamstring. So this is just a screenshot of the list at some point in its life. Um, so 
76 words is still um, is still pretty pretty limited for um, for a seeded topic model. Um, so what what a seeded topic model is going to do is we're going to try to uh, basically fit our topics to the topic space that's established by the seed list. And so what we want to do is we want to make the seed list more robust by um, finding like words, contextually similar words, to words on the seed list um, before we fit our topic model. So um, what we did here is after pre-processing, um, we used WordNet, um, the database, to find um, synonymous sets, synsets, that is similar words to words on the seed list. Um, and then we used um, word to vec to, um, yeah, to basically fit these, I'm, I'm not gonna get into all the details, but basically we used word to vec to um, fit our bag of words, um, uh, our, our bag of words texts um, on the, uh, yeah, on, on these seed lists. Um, so we, used a set of 800 and almost 900,000 Danish tweets since April 15. Um, then we input our augmented query list. Oh, okay, sorry, I got the order a bit confused. Um, so we took our sin sets from WordNet, then we um, fit uh, word to on the Twitter data so that all of our Twitter data is also um, sort of represented as word embeddings. Um, which gives us information about how related words are, so how synonymous they are, how antonymous they are. Really, this is just a measure of how likely they are to co-occur in similar documents, in similar contexts. Um, yes, and then we input our augmented query list to get 10 related entities to each query. Um, we kept them if they didn't appear more than 500 times in the data set. Um, this is just due to the sort of power law that governs all uh, NLP and corpus linguistics, which is that the most informative uh, words are the ones that are more rare. High frequency, like occurring more than 500 times in a data set, uh, strongly indicates that that, that word will not be um, particularly informative relative to lower frequency words. Um, so, yeah, this was the, the process for the seeded model. We interact with this plot here, and I haven't looked at it in months, so I can't really tell you anything about it, but um, this was the result of our, of our seeded topic model. I think we, this is 20 topics, um, and uh, yeah, this worked really well. Um, I think we really needed to have probably a larger group of research, researchers and a larger seed list um, to get as sort of more robust uh, results, but um, it was also sort of uh, tricky um, finding sin sets for some of these words, which were um, very specific to the COVID crisis. So maybe not with a lot of synonyms yet, um, but this was really worth doing. And uh, I would like to explore down the road um, more ways of sort of having our, our um, NLP models and our statistical models informed in some sense by input and expertise from um, ethnographic and, and qualitative researchers who are also working on this project. Um, finally, um, our unguided LDA topic models um, were based on uh, tweets, uh, Danish tweets collected between February 1st and um, April 8th in Danish. Um, so as I mentioned before, um, we were during this period streaming um, from Twitter based on Danish COVID related keywords like COVID-19 deco. Um, and for the February data, what we did is we took a large uh, public COVID tweet set that was multilingual and um, we extracted all of the, um, the Danish tweets there. So the tweet set had been classified um, using either LangDetect or Twitter's native classifier. So we just took all the Danish ones. Um, so uh, what we wanted to do here, what we were most interested in here is looking at the sort of transition in um, 
topics um, over time. So during different stages of the pandemic unfolding, what were people talking about? Um, so we're looking at, at the topic composition of individual tweets. And um, based on the parameters we set here, we um, usually found between one to seven different topics with varying degrees of probability in a tweet. Um, a plurality of our tweets contain a single topic, 35% two to three topics, and uh, the remaining 9% contain more. So um, for the most part, we, we have um, privileged uh, a strong um, topic to tweet uh, relationship, so one to one. Um, yes, and so in terms of our event, of event alignments, um, we're interested in the onset of lockdown, um, strengthening of the, uh, the measures um, a, a week later in March. Um, these are really mostly aligned with Meta Fredrickson's uh, uh, press conferences. So um, the, I think the, the major one announcing lockdown was on March 11th, um, and then subsequent weeks, uh, every week she had a press conference. So, um, yeah, this is the trajectory of this, this one month period that we were interested in. So the red dotted lines here um, indicate each of the events that I just mentioned. So the first red line is March 11th with the lockdown. Second one is March 18th with more restrictions. Um, the third one is um, the extension of lockdown. And the fourth one is the uh, cancellation of um, sorry, the plan for controlled reopening uh, being announced. Um, so what we get here is a, um, a daily moving average of this, uh, sorry, we get a moving average of the daily topic usage. So that's what we're, that's what each of the little blue uh, points is here. Um, and the squiggly line are the um, KZ filtered daily means. So let's look at some of the topics that emerge here. Um, so this one, topic 11, seems to be um, mostly about the, uh, the major information events every week with the uh, um, Office of the Prime Minister and her weekly press conferences. So uh, asking about um, time, yeah, press conferences, the um, at, it's actually very hard to, to read this. It's very small. Um, I'm not sure who that at is, but um, I think it's something related. Um, topic two um, seems to be about lockdown and scarcity. Um, so closing, um, hamstering, uh, and um, glensa, which I guess is ambiguous. It could be a border in the literal or metaphorical sense. Um, but we see that this one peaks um, around the time of the lockdown, around March 11th. Oops. The next one um, that I found interesting was uh, topic 18. So children, young people, um, here, important, help, old. So possibly this topic is about vulnerable population groups. Um, and also, um, this this one peaked uh, a little bit into the lockdown period, and then um, and then went down after the announcement of, of um, uh, you know a plan for for reopening in in, in mid April. And um, topic nine is seems to uh, suggest information uncertainty. So questions, answer, uh, find, uh, read. Um, yeah. So. The point here is, you know, not not so much that we're learning about things that we didn't already know were going on in the discourse space, but what we're we're seeing is some sort of um, some sort of of, of uh, qualitative uh, support for these models that were generated automatically. Um, so their their alignment with the uh, events that we picked out um, seems to seems to fit well, um, and the um, and the topics themselves seem relatively coherent and and legible. Um, yeah, the last one was just topic three, uh, probably one of the those sort of persistent topics, which is just tracking uh, the course of the epidemic. 
so dead, uh, infected, and, and so on. Um, yeah, so we, uh, what we'd like to do next is extend our topic models. So we have, um, we have this uh, model for information dynamics that I discussed in the first section, uh, which is built on top of um, an LDA topic model. So um, as I mentioned before, what I'd really like to do next is to um, run uh, those models on tweets um, instead of newspapers, um, and then also uh, extract um, topics uh, from those models so that we can actually measure um, the, the, uh, um, how, how much certain topics drive the information patterns that we see, like the decoupling of novelty and resonance. Um, we'd like to do this for all three of our Scandinavian languages, um, which are divided into two different waves. We've got April 15th to June 23rd and August 3rd to, uh, well, actually at this point, September 8th. Um, so unfortunately, we don't have the comprehensive Scandinavian sample for that first period of lockdown, but we only have it from April 15th. Um, but this would still be a really nice um, long-term um, uh, topic model study to have. Um, yeah, and then the, the final thing I'll talk about today is um, our sentiment analysis, uh, the, the beginning of doing sentiment analysis on the Scandinavian tweets. Um, we did not um, you know, develop any sort of new tools for, for um, sentiment analysis. What we did instead is um, we actually came up with what, what I think is a pretty clever and useful way of using existing sentiment models and um, making sure that, that they're actually consistent. Um, so uh, we've been looking at sentiment in our tweet sets since, um, since the very beginning. So this is from our Danish sample from March. Um, again, event aligned with uh, um, the prime minister's speeches. What we see here is that there is unsurprisingly a, um, a big decrease in overall positive sentiment um, around the time of the lockdown. Um, and this is, so sentiment is, is so scores here are centered on um, March 11th. Um, yeah, and the first public address is, is that first um, red line or the, the lockdown public address is that first red line. Um, in terms of uh, sort of uh, divergence over time, um, that's what that's what this uh, graph is showing. Um, recall that this was a fairly small sample of tweets that we had sampled that we had collected using um, COVID-related hashtags and keywords. So one thing about uh, this data is that it does show a pretty large effect um, of uh, sentiment decreasing during this period, but it's just the tweets that are about coronavirus. Um, so what's again really nice about our Scandinavian collection is that um, we have all the tweets. We use stop words, so they're not just the corona tweets. Um, we decided to use, so Vader is, a, is an existing um, a package for um, assigning sentiment scores um, using both lexical and rule-based um, assignment. And it uh, already existed for Danish and Swedish. We manually extended a version um, for Norwegian. Um, and this, so um, the goal was, of course, to have comparable sentiment scores for each of the three Scandinavian languages um, for our subsequent analyses. So this is just what the, uh, what one of our data sets would look like. Um, you've got the text of the tweet, including emojis, because those are very important for sentiment assignment. And then you've got, um, a positive score, a neutral score, and a negative score, um, and the compound score is sort of the composite of those. Um, so the lexicon that, that uh, Vader is based on um, has words and they are, um, so the occurrence of a word is going to um, come with a uh, likelihood of positive, negative, or neutral, and then you take the composite once you have the whole tweet. Um, word by word. So this is what the density map of our um, Scandinavian tweets look like by compound sentiment score. 
Um, unsurprisingly, this is uh, typical. Um, since you know most tweets aren't strongly um, uh, aren't, aren't strongly valenced, they're not particularly emotional. We have a big peak for all three languages at uh, at zero at neutral. Um, I think uh, I'm, I was very puzzled by the lumpy distribution of Norwegian tweets. Um, my hypothesis, hypothesis is that it may be uh, due to um, retweets. Uh, so if we are including, oh no, actually this is no retweets. That's right. I'm actually, I'm still really not sure why we have this lumpy distribution for Norwegian. Um, so this is what it looks like if we, um, if we plot um, the, um, average uh, sentiment scores per language um, over the period from April 15th to June. So we did this back in June. Um, and what's interesting is, so Norwegian's blue, Danish is red, Swedish is yellow. Uh, what's immediately interesting here is that they never cross. Um, Norwegian just seems systematically more uh, positive than the other two languages. Um, so this should immediately prompt us to ask, is this a uh, pattern real or is this some property of our model that's distributing the scores this way? Um, so uh, we decided to experiment with this. Um, first, we, we used automatic translations um, to compare the, the score assigned to a Danish sentence and then its translation in Swedish. Um, and then we came up with an even better way of doing this, which was we generated sentiment scores for two million parallel sentences from the open subtitles corpus and compare their scores. Um, and what we found is that there is some skew um, due to the different sentiment models, um, but not so much that it would account for the, um, for the amount of spread that we, that we saw, or for, the, for that um, systematic uh, picture that we saw a minute ago. So, um, so yes and no. So, so it is a little bit skewing the data, but it actually seems that there's a real effect here. So what um, our, our wonderful student workers at, at Center for Humanities Computing did um, over the summer is they um, actually trained a neural network to fit the optimal nonlinear fit based on the open subtitles parallel data um, and the compound scores in order to um, have a a sort of normalization algorithm to apply to our Scandinavian tweets to get rid of this skew. Um, and just uh, in the past couple of days, we've applied this. Um, so what we see now, so this is just the, um, the means untransformed um, and transformed and further normalized. So in addition to the um, to the, the normalization um, based on this um, neural network, we're also doing a standard minus one, one normalization, um, which means that during a period, during a window, for us it's six hours, um, whatever the most negative uh, score is, that gets set to minus one. Whatever the most positive score is, that gets set to one. Um, and this is just a really, uh, um, typical um, method for normalizing uh, tweets for, for sentiment and tweets, uh, texts um, in sentiment analysis. Um, okay, so and as I explained before, we have two different waves. We've got a first wave and a second wave. First wave is April 15th to end of June. Second wave is um, beginning of August until the present. So um, during the first wave, um, we, we see uh, that at some point, um, Norwegian in mid-June, um, the Norwegian tweets seem to get a lot more negative. Um, there was a, there were some um, new restrictions that were announced in um, this period in June, but I don't think that's something that we can, uh, we can, we can actually know whether that's the factor or not, but something's going on there. Um, and for the second wave, um, we again see, uh, we, we see some variation in, in all three um, languages in terms of the, the overall sentiment. Um, in both cases, something is, is interesting about Norwegian, which is that there's just a much, much bigger spread in sentiment. Um, so you see the, the confidence interval 
shaded region for Norwegian is just always much bigger. You can also see the, um, the average uh, six hourly normalized means are just all over the place. Um, so we have to investigate this more, but um, we clearly no longer see the pattern of, of just lines. Norwegian is always uh, more positive than Danish is always more positive than Swedish. So I think now we might actually be getting close to having meaningful sentiment scores um, that we can use for, for other types of analysis. So um, yeah, I'd like to, to end by just talking about research directions. So HOPE phase one has been all about just collecting data rapidly, processing it, and kind of waiting for um, for the research questions to come to us and for the, um, the more sophisticated analyses to present themselves. Um, and so that, that's kind of where we are now with this project. So um, I've talked about a lot of next steps already. Um, so bringing together the uh, sentiment analysis, topic models and information dynamics models. Um, but uh, I'm also very interested in um, you know, much of our data from all the different branches of HOPE um, is time series data. So um, that includes the survey data, it includes the behavioral data from apps and cell phones. Um, there's also a lot of time series data available from other research groups like the Oxford COVID, um, government COVID policy stringency index. Um, so I think uh, doing uh, some more sophisticated time series analyses and uh, causal modeling is a very natural uh, next step. But I would love to hear your questions and further thoughts. Thank you. Sorry. Yeah, thanks a lot. Sorry, I couldn't unmute here. My mouse was lost on the screen. Any questions um, for Rebecca, please raise your hand in the participant window because we can't see everyone at the same time. It's also great if you turn on Mark. Uh, yes, <clears throat> thanks Rebecca. Very interesting. I wonder, um, uh, so when you talked about uh, you know, Twitter being this weird place full of academics and politicians and uh, not really sort of representing um, you know, the common uh, public or the room. Like, um, I mean, some tweets do end up being broadcasted on Denmark Radio, or, right? Mm. Uh, some like, could, do you think that there's any possibility that you can sort of uh, you know, like find all the tweets that sort of break through the Twitter sphere and out into um, normal media and and use them as a sort of a weight, uh, weight them in certain ways to say, well, this this sort of I don't know um, message was generated so much hype that it actually uh, went into uh, the real or at least the, the more regular uh, media landscape, would, would that be uh, uh, even possible? And, and, and would it be interesting? Oh yeah, no, definitely. I think that's exactly the kind of thing that, um, that we're hoping to do. So um, if there's a tweet that, um, if, there's a, if there's a tweet that, that of course it, it has a certain topics associated with it, because that's, that's what our topic modeling would give us. Um, and if it's a highly influential tweet, which would allow us to kind of afford it more weight. Um, we could use, um, you know, similar, uh, the similar, you know, latent variable analysis of our newspaper data to sort of detect whether there is a, an uptick in um, a sort of closely related topic in the legacy media, um, perhaps closely following that high influence tweet. Um, and I think that would be, so that's the kind of signal that like Granger causal modeling would, would pick out as, as highly likely to be causally associated. Um, and so the, I think the bi-directionality here is, is exactly what we want to look at. Um, we're not gonna take for granted that 
it's just legacy media influencing social media. We know that social media also influences legacy media. Um, and the cool thing will be sort of detecting, um, yeah, detecting when topics from one space uh, or and documents and, and topics from one space kind of influence the other and, and why we think that's happening. We've got a question from Winnie. Yeah, yeah. Hi, Rebecca. Um, it's Hi, Winnie. informative in your slides, in your talking. Um, I'm wondering, like, would you take, like, as you're down to Danish social media, would you take the newspapers or media with some kind of like political um, opinions into account when you um, do in Swedish or Norwegian Twitter research? Um, so, so like the, the political spectrum uh, of newspapers in Norway yeah. and Sweden as well? Yeah, I, th I think we would. Um, and well, I mean, we, we definitely would. I'm not actually sure where um, we'll get that information. I think the uh, sort of um, political classification of our Danish newspapers came from um, the insider Danish knowledge of our some of our team members. Um, mm -hmm. So, for, but it's possible that there that there are uh, sometimes there are databases that actually um, list major news sources and where they fall on a on a, a political alignment or a political bias spectrum. Um, but yeah, I think we would we would definitely want to use that information. Yeah, that would be super interesting because like we already seen the differences between um, media from different political lines and maybe that'll be like maybe there'll be similar things in Norwegian and Swedish as well. Yeah, I think that's a super interesting question is so as I said, there's been like past research that, that's sort of detected certain um, information profiles of like natural catastrophes, um, more recently uh, social catastrophes or, or the combination of two. Um, but I guess, I, I guess in, in theory, it might, be, uh, it, it might be possible that we find, um, you know, uh, profiles that, that, that fit the coverage of catastrophes from a particular ideological or political perspective, right? That's also possible. And that would be a super interesting thing to explore. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. So I got myself on the list, Rebecca. It was a very interesting exercise. You did it first, you know, trying to return to March and mm -hmm. remember kind of the degree of uncertainty what that one was facing. Uh, and in a sense, I think what the newspaper data are showing is precisely that, you know, we were in a situation where nothing stuck it, it's, it is, everything was about COVID, but if, whatever you heard about COVID was useless because it wouldn't be the same thing that would be useful in the next uh, couple of days, the next week or so. So do we know anything else from news media studies about similar dynamics? I know this is an unusual situation, but you know, are you identifying a signature that has never been seen before? Or do we know of any historical incidences where news behave like that? that in mm -hmm. a sense, news are not new any longer. I'm actually, I'm not the person to, to probably ask about this. I think it would be um, our co-author, um, uh, Milvin, who I think is the, is the expert on um, these large corpus studies that, that have looked at novelty and, and resonance in their interplay before. Um, if Christopher's here, he might be able to, to chime in. I don't think it's completely novel. I think the, the fact that we assume a more sort of um, chaotic and protracted, um, you know, resolution to the, the, the ordinary behavior, I think that's, that's been seen before and that's kind of expected. Um, Christopher, are you around still? I don't know if he's still here. I am here, but I'm in two meetings, so you, you have to repeat the question, sorry. Yeah, Christopher, so I was saying the, um, uh, this picture where news in a sense didn't stick around when you looked at the newspaper data, that in a sense everything is about COVID, but whatever you hear is not going to be useful during the next couple of days. Have we seen that kind of signature elsewhere or is that unique to the current crisis to the, to the degree that it has been looked at before? Yeah, so that's a good question. We are hoping that it is unique to, catast to, to catastrophes that have a clear natural and a clear cultural component. Mm. 
that is our hypothesis at the moment, because we know approximately at a couple of other in a couple of other models how natural catastrophes like earthquakes look, and mm. we know how in, in in media, and we know how purely or more purely cultural events such as war look, and we are hoping that this decoupling kind of thing is specific to these this sort of intermediate where we have both components, but we don't know at the moment. Yeah. We do, however, know that the decoupling also happens in Dutch newspapers okay. for, for COVID-19. It's a bit, so I, Christopher, I still have some trouble sort of understanding uh, the delineation between natural and social and then a, a combined, because it, it seems to me that, that, I mean, almost all natural disasters, at least maybe of, of the environmental type, have a have some sort of social implications and therefore social dimension you know unless it's an ice sheet falling in the middle of the arctic uh, yeah. where there's less impact on on human lives or communities um so yeah. it's very so it's, it's very hard to to obviously there's no analog to COVID 19 but um you know i'm wondering what the closest analogs would be then of a, of a natural and social catastrophe yeah, yeah. I think maybe these. Um, yeah, no, I don't know. So I think these kind of pandemics are very good, uh, a good, good um, model for that, right? Because here we have sort of something that's sort of spreading slowly, where people's behavior matters a lot, right? While mm -hmm. for a tsunami, you have this gigantic event. People can still behave differently afterwards, but it's this gigantic event that happens at one time, right? And then then it sort of slowly has social repercussions afterwards. While he, with the pandemic events, we have this sort of complicated feedback loop, right? Which is exactly what Hope is studying at the moment. Yeah. So other pandemic events. Okay. So I had a follow-up question then, because you know, we started out with the wonderful Hitchhiker Sky Galaxy, but only bad news traveled faster than the speed of light. Yeah. Um, is there any way that we can actually see this kind of spreading of ideas in the twin sphere? Have you found any good indices to actually, in a sense, follow the Hitchhiker's Guide's logic? Um, yeah, uh, so I would say um, any of the, any of the, the sort of um, network-based analyses that I talked about earlier. So, um, one thing would be, one really natural thing would be looking at um, uh, URLs. So the spread of, um, of, of, of URLs uh, to, um, you know, for example, like at the very beginning of the pandemic, there were, there were a couple just random medium articles that went completely viral. And I swear that every person on my academic Twitter feed, um, you know, shared a couple of these. Uh, um, just by people sort of projecting. So, so I think the common theme was that they were by data scientists who had a, had a uh, good facility with talking to the public. And what they were doing was they were engaging our uh, deep, deep desire to have projections for the future, concrete ones. Um, and this, this kind of, um, these kinds of articles got a lot of pushback from actual epidemiologists because they were generally not written by people with epidemiological training. They were generally written by um, data scientists or uh, Silicon Valley types. Um, but I think that they, they really hit a, a nerve and they really kind of went viral. Um, and one thing you could do is you could very easily sort of track uh, just uh, links um, spreading on Twitter and of course also retweets. Um, and then, um, you know, it's, it's sort of a proxy. It, it's not, not so much, a, it's sort of a proxy for, for news, but um, you could sort of also look at the what happens to the f uh, follower counts for um, accounts that start producing certain types of information or certain types of narratives. Um, so this would be particularly interesting for something like uh, fake news, which tend to originate from a small number of, um, you know, domain names, so news sources, and um, a small number of, of like sort of influencer 
conspiracy theory Twitter accounts. But um, you could see what's sort of resonating and what's sort of spreading by how many followers those people are getting, um, you know, relative to their activity. Cool. Yeah, and, and I think Michael Bang Peterson and, and some of his uh, uh, collaborators in, in political science have done something um, uh, specifically on tracking fake news sharing um, on Twitter in, in the US. So he might have more, more insights. But you didn't ask about fake news, I, I know specifically, but, but bad news, fake news, different types of news, we could use these methods to sort of track. This question? Yeah, uh, thank you, Rebecca. Really, really interesting stuff. A lot of a lot of material, so I don't even really know where to start. But but one of the things that I that I found very interesting was what you said about you know social catastrophes and and natural catastrophes and how the how the different dynamics of the of the catastrophe influence uh, uh, you know uh, social media data and so so on. Um, I I wonder if we know anything about how the crisis dynamics influence the, uh, the, uh, the sentiments. I think that's not one of the things you, you mm -hmm. said a lot about because I'm, I'm, I mean, I, there's a very re good reason why I'm asking. I'm, I'm, I'm doing some, some research on uh, the role of music during the uh, pandemic. And mm -hmm. there we, we see, see different indications that there's kind of a positive effective bias. So, so when people, when we look at the, uh, so, so we have a much smaller data, Twitter data set than, than you do, but when, when we look at some of the music related hashtags, we see that they're, they're very positive. So when, when people talk about music, uh, it's very positive. When they write Corona songs, they're, they're very, 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 very positive. It seems like they're coming from a different planet, essentially. Um, and, and, uh, and, and one of our um, ethnomusicologists in our network said that there's some, something about the dynamics of the crisis. So th this is a slow onset crisis. So so a lot of the time we were reading about Wuhan and we were we were just just waiting waiting for the for the uh, um, for the for the for the virus to hit us. And I guess in in that kind of situation, you're not under direct threat. Um, so so you know maybe you're you're responding in a different way when you're not under direct threat. And I re remember reading. Um, this uh, preprint recently with uh, where they looked at the humor, the, the use of humor in Italy, I think, during the pandemic, where they where they found, if I remember correctly, that that the, the closer the, the disease was to yourself, the the less funny you found uh, the like the memes and stuff like that. So so there's something mm -hmm. going on that like if if the virus is out there as an uncertain factor, you might be responding positively but when it gets too close it becomes more of a negative sentiment is that do you think there's any truth to that or um yeah i mean that that would be super fascinating to to look at in more detail and and i guess it would be um it would be easy enough uh, to do with the combination of a of a long time series of like um tweets that have been assigned sentiment scores and a corresponding um you know, time series of, of epidemiological data for that um, for, for like that region if you could regionally uh, align them somehow um, because I think that's how you'd have to go about answering the question you're asking which is like sort of how you know, how, how close and how much of a threat does the virus virus pose is really a question of you know how um, uh, how uncontrolled is is the local transmission in your region right um, so this would pose kind of a challenge because um, uh, it's actually can be relatively hard to get um, uh, consistent location data from Twitter. Um, and and that, that would be the way it, it would be based on the um, user's location that you would you would determine for most tweets where they originated. Um, there is a, a, a possibility of having a geocode on your tweet if, um, if you post from mobile. Um, but I think I, I, don't, I don't see that very often in the data. So um, I don't think that's actually something we could depend on. But that would be super interesting to look at sort of um, sentiment and also use of humor um, based on regions uh, conditioned by sort of how, how, um, how, how much of a risk does the virus pose to them in that period. Is that kind of what you had in mind? 
Yeah, yeah, and of, yeah. and of course, my 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 special interest in uh, is uh, music. So you know, I would be interested in how how humor has been used in the, in the music, for instance. Um, yeah, and you know how it, like because we, as I said, we're seeing this positive affective bias, and I wonder where where else do do you see that bias? Because I guess generally in the media, it's more of a negative uh, negative effect, I would imagine. Um, yeah, a positive one. Yeah, that, I mean that, that's a it's a very cool um, cool idea for a for a research uh, direction. Any more questions for now? Uh, if that's not the case, uh, then see you all next Tuesday at uh, four o'clock. I've posted the uh, link to the seminar in. It's going to be a review on FNIRS for search recognition, and that's one way or another. Thank Rebecca for a great talk and a great introduction. So see you all next week.